World Series starts tomorrow night, and this year the Fall Classic can go as late as the last day of October. But that won't stop millions of people from staying up as late as necessary to catch the final out. For its most dedicated fans, baseball is much more than a game. It is a cultural institution, a metaphor for life, and fodder for books and films. So what explains this enduring love for a game that's, well, slow, cerebral, and many would say boring? Joining us to play ball tonight, Shell Krakowski, a physician who lives in Kamoka and is also known as Canada's baseball poet. Alison Gordon, a former Toronto Star sports reporter who now writes mystery novels set in the world of baseball. And Andy Brandt, a former cabinet minister in the Bill Davis government, now the chairman and CEO of the LCBO and a self-described baseball fanatic. Well, if this isn't proof enough that baseball can unite diverse worlds, I don't know. But I still want to understand it. Shell, let me start with you. You're a doctor and you've become a poet because of baseball. I don't get it. Well, I... You want me to quote a, a line from a poem, and there's a poem I wrote called A Runner at First, in which I make the statement that none of us really are born to be home run hitters. Might often we get hit by pitches, get a walk, might get a hit, but generally we're stranded at first base. So I and get, we have to make our way. I get the feeling that you, you think of baseball as what, some sort of strategy, outline, or explanation for life. Yes, and the, the last line of the poem is, this runner at first is proceeding around, and the runner is continually wondering eternally how to arrive safely at the place called home. <laughs> okay, I think I get that one. Allison, <laughs> somehow you love baseball so much that it that you had to write mystery novels about it's, it? It sort of I, it <laughs> oddly took over my life. I, now, I, I do not think that baseball is a metaphor for life. I think baseball's a game. I think baseball's a pastime. But I don't, I don't confuse it with, uh, with having any kind of unique metaphysical significance or anything. It's just a wonderful way to spend an afternoon in the sunshine. And it's, um, it's full of drama. I love it for that reason. And I know that when you're writing about baseball, you actually watch baseball. Yeah. Well, not, well, not when I'm writing my novel. I'm not watching baseball. But when I used to work for the Star, of course, I'd be covering games. And I'd have to watch them and write about them. But, but um, it, it, baseball has got me through some very tough periods of my life, in fact. How come? It's engrossing. Um, and I think my, my love for baseball began back in my miserable adolescence. Um, and when I rediscovered it in my adulthood, uh, I became fascinated with it again. And it, it's taken over my life in the sense that I mean, I, I, for most of my life, I was not involved in sports writing at all. You know, Andy, I think anyone who's covered politics knows how busy you probably are now, but have certainly been. And yet, I know, too, that, you know, all these responsibilities, you still found time to go to home and away baseball games. Well, I started attending Tiger games when I was about seven years of age at Tiger Stadium, which, as you know, is being demolished now. Uh, I never attended as many games as I'd like to have attended because as a baseball fanatic you'd like to be there as you well know for just about every game but uh, uh, you find time because it is a game that has a relatively leisurely pace and it's a game that's very anticipatory you can see the uh, the intensity of the game when you're a fan you know when something's going to happen you know when a runner is probably going to steal what the pitch count is and there's the game within the game and if there is a metaphor for life within a baseball game I guess it's that this this action takes place very sporadically you can go along for three or four innings it'll be the most boring game that, that you can possibly be you know watching and then all of a sudden the intensity picks up and you know that something is going to happen like in the 10th 11th inning of the uh, Atlanta New York Mets game just this past uh, week oh, you could see things were happening and then the most excruciating of endings when the pitcher Rogers walks this guy with the bases loaded, why he couldn't get the, I mean, if he got a hit, that would have been yeah. an appropriate ending. But, but it was inevitable. By that time, it was inevitable. Yeah. It, it, well, it, you know, a lot of politicians like baseball. I mean, yeah, they do. Mike Pearson was a huge fan. Mm -hmm. Bob Ray loves baseball. Well, Larry one Grossman of my, was a very one of my, fan. One of my theories is that, is that I think that one of the attractions for a politician, or for anybody really, is that when you're at the, at the ballpark, no one can get at you. Mm. <laughs> you know, you, it, it's just, it's free time. It is absolutely free time. You can't work. 
Well, I do work, in fact, because I do. I, I, yeah. I work at a lot of plot points when, when I'm watching a baseball game. Um, but and it's also, it's also a, a very democratic place. Very. I think the only problem with politicians at ballparks is when they stand up, and be, you know, when, and I mean, no, no politician should ever throw out a first pitch or anything like that. I mean, as Brian Mulroney learned when he, <laughs> he and. Uh, he and George George Bush walked on the field together, and right during the tuna game affair, the entire stands erupted with chants of tuna, tuna. I think that's one of the fascinations with uh, baseball in that, in this day and age, it's politically correct, in that it combines the best of capitalism mm -hmm. with the best of socialism. Mm -hmm. Here you've got a game where you're supposed to win, mm -hmm. yet everybody gets a chance to contribute in an orderly fashion through the batting order. Nobody's left out. It's not a random pass or a ball that's floating around or a puck. Mm -hmm. You're going to get your chance to try and contribute. But you know, democratic, democratic. If you've got millions and millions and millions of dollars, I mean, it seems it's part of the allure of this game is that pretty much anybody could play it, and you'd all run down to the field, and if you were really good at what you did, you know, you won. But now, more and more, it seems with professional teams that the the players aren't really attached. To their team, they don't seem to have well, a patron. game of baseball. I and mean, the business of baseball is another matter. The business yeah. of baseball, I don't you're really talking want about to know about. But seven, the game itself. Yeah, you're still. talking about 700 players in a population, you know, North and South America of what, 400 million people. We're just talking about 700 players. There's a lot of little league going on, a lot of amateur. But you baseball. have to. But in professional sport, I mean, what everybody is looking forward to, obviously. Um, you have to have millions of dollars to buy the best players. And in some ways, it's a fait accompli. You know, if the team has enough cash, we know they're going to purchase the best no. pitchers. Allison yeah, says, no, no, why? The best cause. pitchers can still blow it. Yeah, they best can, hitters but... can still strike out. <laughs> Scrappy, you know, teams with no money can still beat the, beat the richest teams on any given day. Well, but Paula's point is well taken. As a Detroit Tiger fan, <laughs> I can tell you, with a 20 or 25 million dollar payroll up against the Yankees with a 75 or 80 million dollar payroll we didn't have any chance when the season opened I knew that years ago the ball players did stay with the same team and there was an attachment that and that's the business side that you referred to and I understand that but the two teams that are in and all the teams oh, that yeah. competed uh, right up to the playoffs all had big payrolls and that means that um, a middle market team, and I say that only by way of payroll, like Toronto mm -hmm. or like the Milwaukee's of the world, they're not going to get into the World Series unless they get very, very lucky. Now, Cincinnati was very lucky mm -hmm. this year and almost made it on a relatively small payroll. On the other side of the coin, and I, and I don't want to get too technical because we're not... Because you know, I, I won't to, understand. Oh, go ahead <laughs> and get technical. Well, look at Baltimore. Baltimore had a huge yep. payroll and went nowhere. I mean, yep. so... I, I, but you're right. Talk to me about this. There is the perception among some that the players aren't quite as committed to the game in the same way that perhaps they were in the early days, that there is a sense of almost the blasé about some of them. I mean, other than the paycheck needs to be very large. You think that's true? No, I don't. I think they're even more committed today. Um, when you look at the conditioning they go through, these guys are in much better shape than the guys I saw playing, for the most part, uh, as, as a youngster growing up. Uh, plus, the fellows that played in the quote-unquote old days often had other jobs. Uh, you know, in the off-season, you know, they might be driving a beer truck. So they're getting paid well, and I think most of them do take care of their bodies. They're, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. Uh, sure, there's no loyalty to any particular team now because of free agency after the Kurt Flood decision. But you're getting a higher skill level of baseball. So they're no playing, question. I mean, their commitment, I guess, is to the game of baseball, not so much to the team. Is that what you're saying? Well, it, 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 the it, team, it, while they're, while while they're, they're playing, they have that. a commitment to the team. I, I mean, Every I, player I, is different. I mean, when Paul <laughs> Molitor was in Toronto, you knew it was only going to be short term. He was going to be the DH. And those of us who were religious about this sort of thing believed in the DH when Paul Molitor was here. And then he left. And then you saw what happened this year. You know, and you bring up Toronto, and I, and I want to just go there for yeah. a minute, because on the, the flip side of this is the fans. And, I mean, I remember in the mid-'90s when there were all these strikes and, and the ball players were actually willing to sit it out so long as, you know, they were going to mm -hmm. increase their salary. A lot of people felt very sour about that, and there was a real sort of diminishment among some. I mean, Certainly not this panel. Oh, yes, oh, no, yes, 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 yes. There was. My, there my was wife refused because, to go to a because, game Because there was... Is that right? To my mind, yeah. there, are, there are really three kind of parties, responsible parties, make up baseball. 
the owners, the players, and the fans. And they forgot the fans entirely. But it's come back. They, they took our game away from us. And we're interested parties it, in this game. It is coming back. It came back in great part because of Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire in the home run uh, derby that took place last year and again this year. If it wasn't for that, baseball would not have come back to the point where it was even uh, 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 comparatively equal to the way it was before the strike. There are a lot of people who are embittered to this day because of the ball, what the ball players did. And I'm one of them. I just don't like the idea that these ball players can be carpetbaggers and go wherever they want. I mean, there's a reasonable amount of money that a ball player should get. I don't know what that number is. But you've got teams that are at the brink of bankruptcy, not only in baseball, but in hockey and, and throughout sports, because the owners don't know how to discipline themselves. They're trying to do it now in hockey, and hopefully they'll do it in baseball. But uh, I just don't like the idea that the only teams that are going to end up in the fall classic, and this year it's, of course, Atlanta and New York, are teams with very high payrolls. There are, there are no surprises here. I mean, at the first of the year, if we'd made some predictions, but they were we, we would have predicted surprises. those two teams or... Uh, among two or three teams, they would have been there. But you know what this speaks to? An enduring, uh, a lasting relationship that we seem to have with baseball. It can ebb, it can flow, but it comes back strong. And I still need to understand that because while I enjoy baseball and I certainly love hot dogs, I don't even begin to understand the level of passion that we have here. So I, I wonder if I can go back to the poet. How is it, why is it that baseball has sort of penetrated our consciousness why I mean we don't say things like oh I'm feeling you know that this is a very offside at the blue line today that's a real but we do say wow that was a home run or three strikes and you're out how come I think because you have a contrast in the major team sports that are played now and baseball is very different philo philosophically and aesthetically from these these other sports particularly football where you've got a military connotation going on throughout the whole game quarterback throwing long bombs, the linemen working in the trenches, and the whole war imagery of, you know, eating up enemy turf until you finally score. Where baseball is very different. It's pastoral. Ideally, bright, shiny uh, skies, verdant grass, and it's very domestic, as opposed to military. Uh, it's altruistic. You uh, sacrifice to advance a runner, a teammate. Uh, there's even a warning track as a courtesy. And it's the only team sport where it's not a projectile that scores. It's not a ball of any shape or size or a puck that scores. It's the individual. And in this crazy world where the individual has been lost, it's the individual who scores by the most pristine and joyous of, of activities, by arriving home safely. Now, that is such a joyous thing to behold in, in this, this world that is so alienated where homes are breaking up, and you've got this wonderful image of you know somebody what? coming home. You just pulled me into the field of dreams, and I saw the shining lights, and the, and the well, you're going to say something else. Well, I think, too, that it's a game that, that is, is very human. The players are, are, you know, they stand before us naked of, of, of disguise. They don't wear helmets. They don't wear masks. They don't wear pads. They, whatever they are, there they are. They're, they're skinny, they're fat, they're tall, they're thin, and they're all alone. The team sport, but they're all alone. And if you are, God help you, the pitcher that walked in, the winning run, mm. to let the other team into the World Series. You're all alone. You're all alone. And, <laughs> and I think as, as a human being, I identify very strongly with these people in both their triumph and their tragedy. And just going back briefly to something we were talking about before and about the, uh, the, what the players bring to the game. You know, you, you watch them play and you still see, I don't care how much they're being paid, when you know when an infielder leaps and just and, and makes a fantastic you know catch the joy in that player's face is there there's yeah. a tremendous physical joy in this game and and once they always as they always say once they're between the white lines then it's not about salaries it's not about anything it's about playing the game uh, and i think this is partly why writers like it so much because i think that there's it's also a game, so it's a game in which there is this human drama where you see the guy fail. You see his life, you know, ruined by one play and so on. And you know, so you can build little sort of fictions around that. Have you seen the commercial with Tom Glavin and Greg Maddox? Is there any commercial? Yeah, well, give her the punchline. Oh, 
I can't remember. They always like the home run hitters no, like this. Chicks dig, chicks, the chicks dig the home run. Too. No, chicks dig the long run. Oh, yeah. Chicks dig the long run. He the wanted you ball. to Chick, say no, chicks, no. Dig, the chicks long run. dig the long ball. Yeah. Yes. Well, the truth is, Allison, that chicks dig the long poem and guys dig the long mystery novel. And I think that's why we write, and I think that's why we, we, uh, we follow. <laughs> you know what? You know, I wish you were right. You know, I, not, that's not true. I wish you were. You just, I just got a minute here, and I, I don't want you to leave without telling me what's going to happen because the World Series starts tomorrow. Who are you favoring? I hope they both lose. <laughs> That's my line. You I gotta agree. You got to pick one. Uh, Yankees or the Braves? You got to pick one. Uh, I will pick the Braves only because the Yankees have dominated uh, the World Series and the pennant races for so many years. I'm tired of George Steinbrenner. I'm tired of the Yankees. I don't like the Atlanta Braves, but they well, are the lesser of two. Who would you have rather Hawks. seen playing? What 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 would have been a sort of a classic matchup for you? Pittsburgh and Detroit. <laughs> 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 okay, Allison. <laughs> Who's going to win? I refuse to answer that. I hate both teams. I want them both to lose. Good. We're yes. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Who would you rather have seen? <laughs> anyone. Anyone Anybody but else? Atlanta again. Yeah. Anyone but Atlanta. I hate Atlanta. I hate Bobby Cox. I hate those stupid fans in there, Tomahawk Chops. I hate Ted Turner. I hate the way they sing, too. <laughs> I we're, hate that. I hate it. We're all agreed that everybody hates Steinbrenner and Ted Turner. Yeah. So I'm going to make a prediction. Seven games, and we'll all be happy because it's going to be won by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Okay, but come on, you hate it, you hate it, you hate it. But are you going to watch it every second? You're going to yes. watch it every second, yes, every I second. Will. You know why? Every second. Oh boy! Because because if we don't watch this, we have no baseball to see until March, and oh. and the off season in baseball is the cruelest right. cold turkey in sports. The most and beautiful the words you're going to and hear the in the middle of February. To, to the pitchers endure. and catchers yeah. reported to date to their respective camps oh, in Florida and Arizona. Okay, I gotta go it's now. Yeah. Wonderful. You guys have got it bad. You got baseball bad. Thank oh, you for wonderful. being here with us. We're gonna be right back Thank with more of Studio Two. <laughs>